Are you, uh, are you with me? The fourth thing that we see is an inordinate devotion to pleasure and comfort. In Genesis chapter 4 verse 21, uh, 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 the scripture says, and his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all, so, or all who handle the harp and the pipe. Sound, I believe, is something that God wants to use to go to war with in this hour more than ever before. But today, there is such a corrupt sound that is also coming out from the, the musicians of the world and so on and so forth that is competing for the godly uh, and trying to snuff out or silence a godly sound that God wants, that, 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 that God is, that we must amplify in the earth at this time. Let's look at the fifth, is, am I on the fifth? One, two, three, four, five. The sixth thing that, that, that is happening, uh, uh, a sign of the times. No concern for God either in belief or conduct. In Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels when they sinned, but cast them down to hell and committed them to pits of darkness to be reserved to judgment, Jude 15 declares to execute judgment upon all and to convict all of all the un, of, of, of all their ungodly works, the works of ungodliness which they have ungodly wrought, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So we see in this hour that even there's an inordinate devotion to pleasure and to comfort, there is also no concern for our belief and value systems, the world has thrown them to the dogs. Another thing that we see is a disregard for sacredness of marriage relationship and covenant. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, Jesus said, but of that day and hour, knoweth no one, not even the angels of heaven, neither the son, but the father only. And the whole thing about the ecclesia is about the marriage of Christ to his bride, the church, which means that we need to grow up into the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ. And so that we can be part of his bride without spot or blemish, fully adorned with her wedding garments. And there is a disdain today for the marriage covenant, which is an exemplification of the relationship of Christ to his bride, the ecclesia. Already they are advocating the rights of people to marry their pets, and to have sex with their pets. This is the day that we are in. And God needs you and I. We have to stand up. We're in an Esther 414 moment. If we die, we die. If we perish, we perish. But we have to stand for righteousness. Another thing that we see. Was the rejection of the inspired word of God. First Peter chapter 3 verse 19. The Bible says, in which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which aforetime were disobedient. So we see today that people, you can't, in England, they're arresting people for praying on the street. You are being arrested for praying on a street. People were praying in front of an abortion clinic and the woman, the woman was praying silently. She wasn't making noise and she was arrested in front of an abortion clinic. So the world is rejecting the inspired word of God. They don't want to hear the word of God any longer. Next thing that we see is a population explosion. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, the Bible tells us that there was a population explosion. The giants, people began to multiply on the face of the earth. 
on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them. A population explosion was taking place. This is another sign of the times that we are in. Another sign, because my time is almost up, is widespread violence. There is violence escalating all over the world. Terrorism, terrorism has been uh, 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 exponentially, has been multiplied uh, 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 exponentially all over the place. From Nigeria, look at the, the, the war in Ukraine, everywhere. Widespread violence. Genesis chapter 6 verse 11 tells us, and the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And that also caused corruption throughout the society. So verse, uh, Genesis 6, 6, 12 tells us, and that the whole earth was corrupt. All flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Another thing was preoccupation with illicit sexual activity. You'll find that in Genesis 4.19. And Lamech took unto himself two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the other name was Zilla. So they were marrying, they were giving him marriage, they were, there was rampant polygamy. Genesis 6, 2, and the sons of God saw the daughters of men, they saw that the daughters of men were fair, and they took them for wives, and they just chose whatever they wanted. Preoccupation with illicit sexual activity, widespread words and thoughts of blasphemy, Jude 1 15, Jude verse 15, to execute judgment on all and to convict all of their ungodly, uh, the, the ungodly, the ungod, uh, uh, let me start again, to execute, uh, to execute judgment upon all and convict all the ungodly of all their works of ungodliness, which they have ungodly wrought, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So God is calling us into that place where we must take a stand for righteousness. Let me bring something else. The 14th thing that we see was organized satanic activity. From Genesis chapter six, verse one to four, we see a lot of organized satanic activity for which God said, my spirit will not always strive with man. We see the, the, the global cabals, the New World Order agendas. We see the Masonic lodges. We see this very entrenched, systematized satanic activity in the earth right now. Listen carefully. They're about to crash cash to push us into a digital economy that will not be controlled by the high street banks, but will be controlled by the central banks of our nations through blockchain. They will phase out the high street banks. Once they phase out the high street banks, every transaction that you make will be with the central banks. They will give you uh, digital tokens and in a digital wallet on your phone. They will issue social credit scores. And if you are vocal against the government's a totalitarian government, then your social credit score <coughs> is lowered. And then you would not have any fin the, the financial liberty that is your right. They will limit how much you spend on what you spend it on uh, in the name of env environmental pollution. You'll only be allowed, say, 15 gallons of fuel a day or a, a week. If you go to a gas station to buy more than that, they lock down your car. That is was what was what was supposed to happen by 2025, except by divine intervention of God through the prayers of his saints. They will put everybody on a, they, the plan is to put everybody on a universal basic allowance. When you have a universal basic allowance, because the whole world will be AI automated and everything else, 
everybody will be given a universal basic alliance, especially if you're the poor. They are eradicating the middle class so that we go back into uh, what it used to be in the days of Marxism, where you had the bourgeois and the proletariat. They will wipe out the middle class. They already started to do that during the pandemic. So that all the poor, there'll only be two classes of society, the bourgeois and the proletariat. And the, the, the proletariat will work the businesses of the bourgeois and the bourgeois will only give them enough to eat. And then the governments in a totalitarian governments, everybody has a universal basic allowance. So the government is controlling how much you get, what you eat, what you do with what you get, and so on and so forth. They will take your lands. They will take your houses. So this is time to begin to pay off all your debts, pay off your mortgages. Let God give you ownership of your homes and of your lands. Otherwise, they will try to take them away from us. Organized satanic activity. There is a promulgation of systems and movements of abnormal depravity. We find that in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only towards evil. Are you with me? All flesh. God said, has corrupted its ways. These are happening today. God forewarned us in Genesis chapter 6. Noah's name was called comfort and rest. We must labor to enter into God's rest. But God's rest comes in troublous times. So we must find that place in Christ where we are at rest in him in spite of the troublous times that we are in. Just like Jesus sat at the back of the boat asleep when they were crossing the Sea of Galilee and the disciples wake him up and say, Master, carest not that we perish? And that word perish is the Greek word apolomitha. Apolomitha has the gematria of 666. And there are five, four other words in the New Testament that have the gematria of 666. One of them is wealth. But I don't have time to get into all that. So what is this thing about rest in, this, in the midst of turbulent times? In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus begins to say, as I wind down, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am meek. And I am lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. That word burden in the Greek is a word photon or photos. That word photos actually means an invoice or a list of goods and services that a company contracts you to or an organization contracts you to supply for them and if you supply according to their standard then they pay you it's like a performer invoice this is what we want you to do for us that's what the word burden means so christ is saying to us that heavens are releasing invoices, list of goods and services that he wants you to provide for his kingdom. It is absolutely essential that we now understand our kingdom assignments 
and the burden of the Lord that he would have each of us carry on his behalf and fulfill those kingdom assignments. We have come into the day of the emergence of the ecclesia of God, the formation of the remnant company that form the body of Christ. We have come into the day of Gideon's 300. 32,000 were called to follow Gideon. 10,000 were chosen, but only 300 were the elect. This is a great hallowed out moment where God is anointing us and we must rise up and we must stand up to become expressions of his righteousness, his trumpets of truth in the earth. And it's a time where we need to walk more intimately with God, more so than ever. That's the time we are in. The days are evil. Isaiah 60, arise and shine for the light is come and the glory of God shall appear upon you in the midst of gross darkness. We are called to stand up. We must wake up. We must man the walls in our watches. We must watch and pray. We must strengthen the things that are about to die. We must not be lukewarm any longer. We are either hot or cold. In the church of Laodicea, which is the church of this, the, uh, this present age, Laodicea was a city that did not have good drinking water. So they built viaducts from Colossae and Hierapolis. From Hierapolis, Hierapolis had very hot water springs that were of great medicinal value. So they tapped an aqueduct to, tap, to, 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 to channel that water from Hierapolis to Laodicea. But by the time the water arrived in Laodicea, it was no longer hot and refreshing. And along its travel, it picked up bicarbonates. And so when they drank that water, which was now tepid, it caused uh, uh, them to become sick and regurgitate any of the contents of their stomachs. Colossae had cold water streams that were very refreshing. So they tapped or built an aqueduct to channel the water from Colossae to Laodicea. But by the time that cold water arrived, it became lukewarm and also contaminated with bicarbonates. And so when they drank it, it caused them to be sick and it became an emetic, it caused them to vomit. So the hot water spring springs of Hierapolis and the cold water springs of Colossae, by the time they arrived at Laodicea, they were lukewarm. In other words, they were useless to the people of Laodicea. It caused them to be sick. And so in this hour, God is saying that we cannot that he is removing those that are useless to him. He will vomit them out of them, his mouth. Only those that are useful to him. If there was ever a time we needed to man our watches and be useful to his ecclesia and his kingdom and to engage 110%, this is the time. It's time to engage fully. Time to engage without any reservation and time to embrace our kingdom assignment, time to stand up for righteousness, time to become God's trumpet of truth in the earth, time that Christ would deploy us into his kingdom field and to be fully expressed through our lives. God bless you in Jesus name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Apostle Michael.
We thank God for your life, sir. Thank you. I think we are all on fire going into 2023. We will man our watches. Praise the Lord. Thank you. We welcome Dr. Bako, who is joining us this night from Egypt. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, very good day to us. Shalom. What a glorious day. What a beautiful time to be alive in. Thank you, Apostle Adefarasin. And everyone and Sister Sharon who started it off with the reading before the um, time that we were going to pray. And then, of course, uh, Apostle Adefarasin was ready to take off, and we're grateful. That said, I am actually tempted to want to open this up for people to ask questions, make comments, because already I think you've received something. Yes, we're here for the purpose of renewal of covenants. But that's precisely why I believe he approached it from that angle. Which day are we alive in? What day is it? What time is it? in the agenda of God, in the timetable of God. One scripture that I shared the last time was a scripture God gave me for this season. And when I talk of the season, it's not just now in terms of 2023, but up to 2025. And then he also said it was time for deployment. So the scripture first. The scripture is Psalm 31, verse 15. Psalm 31, verse 15. And from the Passion Translation, it says, my life, my every moment, my destiny is all in your hands. Deliver me from those who persecute me relentlessly. The Message Bible says, my I mean, hour by hour, my life, hour by hour, you know, every day of my life is in your hands. And he talks about delivering us from those who are out to get us and so on and so forth. We, at some point, looked at about 30 different translations. But we're not going to go into that tonight. I'm just saying that Renewal of covenant, especially on the day of your birth, is supposed to help you to reconnect with the original timetable of God. And that's the reason why it's important as we handle all of these things that we consistently remember that it's all about God, his timetable, his program, his own agenda for our lives. Let me encourage you even before we go into the time of questions, comments, points of clarification, answers, by saying to you, God is still in charge. He is in charge. He has a timetable. He's running. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Because where iniquity did abound, grace did much more abound. The love of some will grow cold. Iniquity will wax gross. But one good thing is, just like Jesus said, in the world you have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Does it mean things might not get darker? They might get darker. But if they got darker, it's because they're calling for the light. Because the darkest night makes the light shine the brightest. And God is actually... Like I say, still in charge. It might not look like that to some people, but he's still in charge. He is the God of all seasons and of all time. So it's important for us to remember that. So that then if you heard the sharing pertaining to the days of Noah and all the other things that were said, it was just to get towards this one thing that you remember at the end of the day, God is the one who is still in control. As I accept the Lord build the house, the labor in vain that build it. 
except the Lord watch over city, the watchman stay awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early and stay up late only to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Though children are heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb his reward, like arrows in the hands of a mighty warrior, are sons born in one's youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. And thank God for the flaming arrows that we are, because the house of Jacob will be a fire, but the house of Joseph a flame. And we are like arrows in the hands of the mighty warrior. The Lord God himself being the chief warrior. And every one of us who knows that his or her life is a statement of glory, is a prophecy, is an expression and fulfillment of prophecy. Like we see in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 18. And everyone knowing like it is written in Psalm 40 verses 7 and 8, the message Bible that our lives are letters, our lives are parties, our lives are prophecies. You know, if you're reading from the message and the passion put together, that's Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8, you will realize then that your life is supposed to be a letter to the whole of creation, the universe. Your life is a party that has been thrown by God. So let them come to the party. And it is what God wants to serve from your life that they will have to get. And they would have to dance to his music. They will have to eat his diet because you don't go to a party and determine what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. You can choose from what is on offer. And that's what God is saying concerning our lives. I better don't get carried away and start teaching um, you know, trying to encourage you uh, and go too far. But I, I, I just want us to understand something here that it's important for you to see from God's perspective. Now, over to you, uh, Brother Michael, Adeforasin, the Apostle of God. You have your hand raised. Yes, uh, uh, begging your pardon, sir. I, I forgot the main, <laughs> the main point. The main point of everything that I said was that Noah was building that ark for 100 to 120 years. In the building of that ark, the Bible says he coated the inside of the ark with pitch. And that word pitch is a Hebrew word for atonement. So the ark was a covenant expression. And all the people that entered into the ark, Noah was in covenant with God. So it's all the people that who understand covenant and are walking in the fullness of the expression of covenant with God that our God is going to use in this time and God's going to save. And then in Genesis chapter 8 verse 1, it says something. And God remembered Noah. It didn't say God remembered Shem, Japheth, and Ham or their wives. It says, and God remembered Noah. Noah was a covenant man. Apart from remembering every other living thing and all the cattle of the people that were in the boat, it was Noah, the covenant man that the Bible says God remembered. He built the ark. He coated it with pitch. Pitch means atonement. There can be no atonement if there isn't any covenant. And that's the, that was the whole essence. I forgot to underscore that point. There was a whole essence that in the days of Noah, we have to understand our covenant walk with Christ, the covenant terms and our covenant obligations. Amen. Amen. Uh, Catherine, you had your hand up. Thank you very much, Apostle Adair Farson. Sorry, you seem to be breaking, Catherine. This is a mistake. Sorry. Oh, okay. What's a mistake? Okay. Anybody else wants to make a comment, point of clarification, contribution? Let's have that and then we'll make the most of the time. We have about 31 minutes if we're going to keep the 
regular time unless we want to push it to the elastic limit. So I felt that maybe we'll make the most of the time if, sorry, um, you're not seeing my face, okay. You know, if we want to make the most of the time, then let's use what we have now so that then we can actually be able to put in as much as possible within the short time left. So if you have questions, comments, points of clarification, contribution directly related to what has been shared or something that has been a bother to you, because some of you might be wondering, okay, you say God is still in charge. God is running his timetable. How come certain things are happening? And he doesn't seem to be there. Any question, comment, point of clarification? Otherwise, while you're thinking, let me share that scripture again. Uh, I've already said before now that this year is the year of deployment for fullness of expression. And our brother, while sharing, referred to that again tonight. Um, so, since you are being deployed, you would actually be the one bringing atonement to your sphere of society because you become the Noah with the Ark of the Covenant in that sphere of society. Beginning with the Ark of the Covenant of your heart to then your family, to then your community, to then your city, to then your nation, your continent. So it's important that we understand exactly what God is talking about there. But I said, I want to share Psalm 31 verse 15, and probably just from the two versions, 15 and maybe 16a, um, that will be from the maybe first, let's look at the message bible and then we can look at the passion translation and probably one or two others uh it's interesting and there are quite a few versions that say it very interestingly some say my future some say my destiny some say my life but it is the Message Bible and the Passion Translation that we want to use. So, okay, let me share the screen with you. And then just let's understand that God's government, God's timetable, God's own agenda is what is being executed right now. Okay. Um, the message starts from verse 14. Desperate, I throw myself on you. You are my God. Then verse 15. Hour by hour, I place my days in your hand. From today, let every hour of your life be an opportunity to rededicate your life, to recovenant your life to God. Hour by hour, I place my days in your hand. So that every day, each hour counts. May God help us in our various families, in our various communities, cities, nations, to begin to rededicate, recovenant our lives, our homes, our lineages, our ancestries, our communities, our cities, our nations, hour by hour, placing all our days in his hands, safe from the hands that are out to get us. Let me say this. It might look like there are all kinds of plans up the sleeves of the enemy. It is only while men sleep 
that the enemy can sow tears and go his way. But when you are awake, like it happened in the case of Abraham in Genesis 15, he drove away the birds of prey that tried to come and eat the covenant sacrifice. May God wake each one of us up. May God help us to be alive, awake, alert, vigilant. He said, warm me, your servant, with a smile. Save me because you love me. Of course, if you want Ted to go on, then embarrass me by not showing up. I've given you plenty of notice. Embarrass the wicked, etc., etc. Let me just leave it there. Let me read the Passion Translation, and probably people can make a comment or two, and then we'll move on from there. You did hear that at the end of the day is making atonement that is really making the difference, okay? My life, my every moment, my destiny, it's all in your hands. So I know you can deliver me from those who persecute me relentlessly, those who stop at nothing. You will deliver me. Smile on me, your servant. Let your undying love and glorious grace save me from all this gloom. Okay, so I think I've said enough for just this aspect of making the comment before I listen to questions. Unless, of course, we have probably decided to extend the time, then we can go into maybe a teaching. But I thought that probably looking at what is there, it will be a useful thing to have a discussion around some of the things that are happening, contemporary things, and maybe how they relate to your covenant. What does your altar have to do with these things? What does your personal covenant have to do with all of these? What do covenants in general have to do with the things that are happening? How much of that is happening because of the covenants with various deities? including, for example, the Greek god chaos that is responsible for the chaos currently in the world, or the Pluton, Plusos, that we all know about, that is responsible for the things that are happening with service to Mamonas and all of that. Anyway, let me stop and listen to the questions or comments, points of clarification. So let me see uh, if you want to ask a question and maybe I'm not seeing your hand, you can type, you know, I have a question, at least that helps. Otherwise, raise your electronic hand and then we'll move on from there. Questions, comments, points of clarification, contribution. William has your hand up. Okay, go ahead, Winnie. I, I would like to know what are the five levels of sonship? Five levels of sonship. What, well, yeah, what are the five I would, levels of I would let, you know, Apostle Adepharasin answer you uh, so that we don't go too far and wide into, you know, the various... Uh, categories and various levels, various, you know, segments and all of that, expressions and all that, whether you're talking at the level that you have several under just the aspect of a technia, or you're going to the aspect that has to do with, you know, the young men in general that we can actually talk about or you're talking, you start even with the aspect of children and the various levels and then the various categories and the various expressions or going to the aspect of adults, matured people and the various expressions, at least three different, you know, categories and then expressions. So Apostle Adepharsin, please go ahead.
because I guess what she's talking about is the five basic levels of maturity, you know, which she called five levels of sunshine. Which is what I said. So basically the five basic levels are the first one is Napios, which is an infant. Paul said, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word of God. Then from Napios, we grow to Pideon children. A Pideon children is like a child is like an infant, um, while a Napion, a Napios child is a babe. Then from Pideon, you go to Technon. A Technon is, is an older child. Yeah. Then from Technon, you go to, um, Neoniscus. A Neoniscus is a youth. And in the Bible, youth were up to the age of 40. Yeah. And then a real son is a full grown son, a son that has matured into the fullness of the character, the nature and the lifestyle of Christ. And you, like I said, you find that in Romans chapter 8, verse 19, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 37 and other scriptures. God is looking for those full grown sons in this hour so that he can deploy them into places in his kingdom to bring about the fulfillment of his purposes. It is these people, I also believe that he wants to begin to transfer the wealth of nations to, because they will not waste it they will steward those resources righteously for the advancement, judiciously for the advancement of his kingdom on earth. So if there was ever a time that we need to prioritize our spiritual growth and development, this is it. So those are the five stages of going up into mature sonship. Napios, Pideon, then Technon, Neoniscos, then we us. And then after that, you have a pater, which is a father. Amen. Time will not allow us to get into the details of each one. But you'll find that when you examine each stage, there are particular things that um, you are contending with that God allows into your life to be catalyze your growth and your development. So at each stage, the things you're dealing with vary. The things you're dealing with vary from stage to stage. It is incumbent for each and every one of us to understand what stage of growth we are at. Then we under, understand the nature of God's dealings with us so that you don't get discouraged. Oh, why am I going through this? Why am I going through that? And so on and so forth because it's at your stage of growth that the stage of growth dictates some of the things that you go through because God wants you to grow. The unfortunate thing about this is that we can remain just as you, in your physical body, you will grow and mature, but spiritually you can remain a spiritual babe all your life because you refuse to prioritize your spiritual growth and development. And that is what has happened a lot, especially in the church world, because we have majored on, 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 on the minors rather than grounding people foundationally. And on this platform, many people don't understand. Many of us have limited understanding of covenant. And that is also the partly due to our level or stage of spiritual growth and development. And it's very, very important that we understand this thing about covenant. Because that's the, the, the part of the foundation of our whole Christian walk with God. Amen. Let me not take too much time. Thank you very much. I believe that was a very good summary of what is there. Um, let me probably just give you a gift of pointers you should look for, and that's for everybody. 
Um, I'm just sharing maybe one or two slides out of a whole training uh, that was for training, uh, training the trainers. Um, this was something that we did for the foundation. Um, let me just quickly go on to show you what I have. I believe you can see my screen. Um, we talked about operations of the kingdom in terms of sons, the development process of sons from children to young men to fathers, which is what he has clearly elucidated. Now, after talking about that, we said there were some basic things you should look for. And that's all I want to share with you. For the stages of spiritual growth and fundamentals, whatever it is that you're talking about, whether it is under, you know, the first stage of Nepios where you have Brefors and all of those others, including Thalazo, Ateginatas, Brefors and all those. Please, these are seven things you should look for. So I want you to take note of them. What is the key or the anchor scripture or scriptures? Two, three scriptures that you can say are pivotal to that particular stage of growth. What are the meanings for the various words that describe that particular stage of growth? What kind of diet do you need to feed the person at that stage of growth or feed yourself if you're in that stage of growth? What are the identifiable characteristics and fruits? Because you say, I don't know who it is. I don't know where I am. I don't know what kind of diet then will be most appropriate. Okay, identifiable characteristics and fruits. Number five, what responsibility or responsibilities will be most appropriate so you don't overload and break the neck of the person that is at that stage of growth. Or you don't also end up insulting the person with responsibilities that are just like a waste of time for that person. Number six, what are the critical considerations that you should take into cognizance before you now say, okay, now that I've known where this person is, these are critical things I need to take note of and take into cognizance before now I say the person is being deployed. Then what are the application oriented planning, implementation, monitoring and evaluation strategies? That's the time there. Application oriented planning, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation strategies. I think that's enough. So let me hear the questions from the others, because like he said, I don't think we should take too much time on this. At the appropriate time, we can go into some of these things about stages of growth, but they are very important. And one scripture that you will need definitely will be first John chapter two, from verse 12 to 14, that becomes an important scripture. If you want, you can start from verse 10, but definitely you can't leave out verse 12 up to verse 14, because they are described there, and then you can spawn out into Hebrews chapter five, Hebrews six, and all of that. Let me stop there. I hope that helps you, uh, Sister Winnie. Yes, it was very clear, thank you. Excellent. Any other question, comment, point of clarification? We still have at least 12 minutes if we want to stop exactly on time. So if you have a question, comment, point of clarification, contribution, please feel free. And Jörg, if you have anything to add or say, feel free, because you helped us to even um, quickly recognize Sister Winnie asking the question.
No, thank you for now. All right. Anybody else? Arlene, Hannah, Merle, and Clyde, Baker, Wanjuru, Salome, you were one of the first people to come for this meeting today. And Sister Sharon Omowumi, apart from Sharon Brown, of course, that was their reading. So what do you people have to say? Comments, points of clarification, contribution? Uh, Brother Kweku, you were one of those first people here, and you've helped with scriptures. Let's hear from you all. Brother Victor, you were also here earlier. Is he still here or not? Okay, Maureen, please go ahead. Uh, good evening and uh, maybe good afternoon, depending on where you are. Yes. Uh, today was the first time I, I joined this uh, platform and I was so blessed by the, by the message from Apostle Michael. And I was just wondering when next uh, do you have this, uh, this um, uh, training or this session so that I can always be joining? Thank you. Thank you for coming. And we're glad that you're able to make it with your family and um, you enjoyed it and you want more. I'm sure that the end, the specific date will be announced, but for now it's usually every other week, fortnightly, but the date will be announced by the one who is coordinating the program tonight. So you're most welcome. Whoever invited you, you know, invited you based on certain things. So. I'm sure they will help you with that. But in the event that, you know, you forget anything, don't forget the announcement today and the time and the date. Okay, but you Thank can say you. it's two weeks from now, definitely. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Hannah, go ahead. Hello. Thank you Hello. so much for the insightful sharing that we've received. Um, now, some of the uh, the items that have been mentioned are, are, are quite serious. Um, let's say like the, the one that's dealing with the GMO. And my question is, is, is there any further information or is there any deliberate move to create an awareness uh, in nations so that um, we are not uh, taken advantage of by, by reason of ignorance or because also these things do involve money at times and then we're not, uh, uh, we, we don't get ourselves to sell off nations, if I can use that word, and, and, um, and allow such uh, dangerous things to come into the nations. Uh, I hope my question is clear. I believe so. I can let uh, our brother, Michael Adeferasen, Apostle, answer your question. Are you speaking from Malawi? Yes, I am, yes. Okay. Um, our hearts go out to you with the issue of cholera and all that. However, um, I think one of the best ways you can really get things working properly, apart from seed banks and all that, is first of all, reach out to some of the leaders there, both the older generation, like uh, Matoga, you know, Jeffrey Matoga, and people like Zach Ziyamba, uh, Jeremiah Chukwaza, all of the others. Don't let me, you know, run the risk of saying some names and leaving other names out. Um, mm -hmm. So it's possible to get the older generation, the middle generation, the younger generation, all to begin to cooperate and give specific 
you know, instructions and assignments to them. But don't let me go into answering your questions with specifics after I've assigned it to someone. So over to you, Apostle Adefras. I think Dr. Bako is more qualified to, to speak <laughs> on this subject than I am. But my two cents is, is, is this. Um, we have to begin to pray and infiltrate the cabinets of our governments and, and so on and so forth so that we can begin to inform them of all the what God is saying about these things and what the world is doing about these things so they are aware. The greatest challenge is their ignorance, the ignorance of our governments. We all need to be, in my opinion, eschatologically literate, and we need to understand and expand our worldviews. What is happening on the African continent, in my humble opinion, is that our leaders, whether are ignorantly selling the birthright of the nations by accumulating debt. I think Nigeria's debt is up to $35 trillion. That is a lot. And with the debt indebtedness of our nations, they borrow money from the IMF or from the World Bank or from other sources that impose conditionalities upon us, upon our nations. And part of those conditionalities, apart from restructuring, privatization, the, many of the conditionalities come with agricultural policies that we have to now begin to buy seed from abroad, from one or two organi world organizations that manufacture that seed, Monsanto, for example. And so I remember in 2015, during the time of um, the former president of Nigeria, good luck, Jonathan. Um, some organizations, the Rockefeller organization came, Bill Gates came, and he gave them under the auspices of the uh, uh, Okonje Wella, they gave them a lot of land in Nigeria to for agricultural purposes. And in my opinion, these were wrong people to have been given land in those nations. Same thing in Kenya. And they welcomed them in open with open arms and the, the, the stage was set for where we have arrived at today with this issue of genetically modified seeds. So God has to begin to educate you and I and teach us how to get into infiltrate uh, uh, the governing bodies of our nations and begin to give advice and counsel or discipleship so that they're educated about all these things so that we can begin to deliver ourselves from the bondage that our leaders have placed us in. And uh, like I said, Dr. Bako is much more qualified to talk about these things than I am. That is an excellent, you know, a contribution there. The aspect of governance and the government actors in terms of office holders. But more often than not, it's because of the so-called invisible hands behind it. But the invisible hand that is behind, even the invisible hands should be God that should be able to control them whichever way he wants. Uh, so I agree with you that we need to pray uh, in terms of speaking to power and even being able to be more strategic in our approach where we talk to people who have the president's ear or the various ministers of agriculture, finance and all that, their ears and ensuring that, okay, I might not be in that position, but I'm influencing government and governance by speaking to those that have direct access, we could do that. But you would also realize that more often than not, it is the adage, he who pays the piper dictates the tune that we're seeing in operation. 
for example, where HANA is, I mean, the president is not only spiritually literate. Uh, if my memory serves me well, he was the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God for not less than 16 years, probably about 20 years. Is that correct, mm. Hannah? Yes, very correct. Now, so he knows he is one of those that even at the global level, he was one of the executive members. He has preached in various places. I was privileged to come and preach quite some years back uh, when he was still you know, general superintendent of the Assemblies of God. And at uh, your stadium in Lilongwe, I was privileged to prophesy over them. He and Chris Daza, and the rest is history. We're on a different platform, so I can't go into too many details now. But what I'm saying here is that sometimes they go their hands are tied because the average believer with all the resources he or she has around the world would sit on the resources rather than releasing them to help to give that level of bite to political office holders. So when the other side sponsors them, they have to come for, you know, payback. I have heard about Kenya and the things that are happening, but that's just an aspect. What do we do to rescue these people? I think that's one of the questions. The other question was, okay, uh, what do we do to even try and um, uh, have our own seeds, like seed banks and all that? But one thing he pointed out, Sister Hannah, is the fact that even when you have your own seeds, when these people you know, buy large tracts of land and they plant seeds to contaminate your own seed, unless you have people who have been deliberately planted even in their farms to pray for crop failure, mm. you might have contamination of the good seed that you have. And if it came to the aspect of, you know, projects, do we need all of the monies that we've been borrowing? Ethiopia mm. proved that you don't need to borrow money to do mm. huge projects because the dam, they actually got the money from their citizens. What's mm. the current population of Malawi? About 17 billion. 17 million. Okay. Billion. Seven. Sorry? Mm. 17 million. Yes, 17 million. Yeah. Now, 17 million people. Uh, what percentage would you think is 80 and above? Um, over 60%. Okay, over 60%. Yeah. So yeah. let's decide that we're calling it just 12 million, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, 60% would be almost two thirds, not quite two thirds because you need 66%. So two thirds of 18 would have been 12. So let's even take it as 10 million, 10 million. What's the largest project Malawi has done that you know of? I'm being practical now. Energy, I think the largest are energy projects. How much did it cost? Um, I think about 12 million US dollars. 12 million the, US dollars. Yeah, one of the recent ones, yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. 12 million US dollars. And you have 10 million people, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it means all you needed was to be able to collect about how much a month, 12 million divided by 10. 10. That's 1.2 million a month. So mm -hmm. 1.2 million a month divided by 10. What do you have? That's 120,000, right? Yes, yes. So 120,000, that's just 
talking about 10, but we were, we were actually supposed to divide it by maybe four every week. And then, so 52 weeks to see the weekly amount you're supposed to be, you know, contributing. So let me do the four weeks for the 120,000. Mm -hmm. 120,000 divided by four. How much do you have? It is what? 40,000. Mm -hmm. Now, if you decide that that 40,000, you're going to be able to collect it over a period of, say, 10 years, because usually you don't pay the debt in one year. Then what you do, you could do borrowing against what you're contributing. So you're not servant to the lender. Mm -hmm. In the case of, you know, uh, what, what was I saying? Actually, if you were collecting 100 times 10 million, that's how much? $100 a month times 10 million. How much would that be? Is it 10 billion? 1 billion. 1 billion, okay. So that's already more than your 120 million. Sorry, I almost mm. made a mistake. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if you were to actually say just $100, even for the whole year, that's 1 billion. And do you think, you know, realistically speaking, Sister Hannah, that if you just across board averaged out, the Malawian will be able to afford $100 for the whole year? As you can, yeah. Precisely yes. my point. Yes. So it's just yes. a matter of strategy and doing mm. what needs to be done. Mm. Mm. So imagine that you have some Malawians that can even give a thousand dollars as against a hundred dollars. There are. Mm. I mean, you have more than enough. Yeah, true, true. All we need to do is have a list of people that form the you know committee or the group that everybody can trust, and they will give account at the end of the day and how mm -hmm. much is left in the coffers and all that. Actually, mm -hmm. Ethiopia did that, but the people that don't want nations to be free now decided mm -hmm. Oromia and all those challenges there has to be war because this is a bad example for the rest of Africa. Mm -hmm. Egypt decides mm -hmm. to start building where I am currently and they are even building a new capital. Yes, they've borrowed quite a bit and all that, but they start rising and then there are economic, you know, uh, tools that are being used now to try and hit them. And uh, now they're trying to, you know, get a few people to try and call for a revolution, which shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass, unless the Lord builds the house. They labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord watch over a city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. It's mm. going to cut on both sides. But I won't go further than that. It's because mm. certain people are not happy to see people actually becoming independent, being the best, mm. as God mm. said that, you know, the rest of the world will be coming to learn from Africa. The longest, you know, monorail in the world is being built in Egypt. The tallest, you know, towers, the first three tallest towers are currently being built in Egypt, you know, for the whole world. Um, mm. I could go on with so many things, including, you know, the number of bridges, number of roads, in the desert and some of the programs and projects. But it's like, no, 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 no. If you allow these people to succeed, then the rest of Africa is gonna copy. And before you know it, they're all gone. Mm. <laughs> so they're trying to fight that. Mm. That's where you mm. and I come in. This is the mm. reason why if I were not privileged to be the initiator of some of the things on this platform, I still want to join a platform like this or any other platform. And Jörg is on the platform. He knows. I've tried to reach out to somebody in Jerusalem through, you know, one of his key advisors to see how we could collaborate so that we can spread this all over the world and see how mm -hmm. we can saturate mm -hmm. the world with the right kind of prayers 
And then mm-hmm. we'll also come into training and development for people to have the right strategy to take mm-hmm. back our nations. So mm-hmm. short question, long answer. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me just end it this way. It is possible for us to turn things around. But right now, we have a challenge in Kenya. We have a challenge in Nigeria. We have a challenge in Ghana. We have a challenge in South Africa. And even the new person they think might be coming in, they're trying to do their best to sponsor him. They've offered him left, right, and center, all kinds of things. Where Mm -hmm. are our people? Mm -hmm. That's where Mm -hmm. the whole thing about networking comes Mm -hmm. in where now we can say, okay, uh, brother so-and-so, who happens to have been from Zimbabwe, I believe originally, though he's lived in the US, he's an American and all that, in his network, he happens to be, you know, having an individual that makes $35 million a day. So giving a day in a year would not be a challenge. Mm. That's more than your entire energy project, you know, almost yeah. thrice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Just one day's earning. Yeah. This is why the whole thing about unity, the Psalm 133 God has talked about over and over again, needs mm. to come into play. Mm. I think I've answered your question. Thank you. Thank we you. Both, actually. Yeah. All right. Thank maybe you. the last question, because we've gone beyond the you know, have our mark if we're to stretch all the way to the end of the hour, the top of the hour. We can answer one more question and then we can have the announcements before the time elapses. So or are there other comments, please? Comments, points of clarification, contribution. Arlene? Please go ahead. Um, shalom, everyone. Good morning, good evening. You know, I have been um, trying to, when I listen to um, Apostle the Ferrison and the topic of today, um, thank you so much. It's, it's, it actually is making my mind think a thousand. And there's so many things, so many thoughts, so many different directions. But the part that is really that um, I'm kind of, as I process it is on the point number four and the secular humanitism. We know that a lot is happening and I'm asking myself, maybe I don't know if it's a question, maybe I'm just throwing it out because it's stirring up in my spirit because one of the things is that, you know, I think one of the things is that as, as we begin to stand up for righteousness and we are supposed to condemn the things and then here is, is secular human uh, humanitism is where do we draw the line between um, how do we use because we definitely want to use sometimes the weapons of the enemy against itself or for the for the establishment of the kingdom so where do is drawing that line between determining um, and, and I'm asking myself in my spirit I'm like and God maybe you can help me Dr. Paco because it's turning around in my head is how do we challenge that part between how do I use all the things that I see secular that I use in, in, in the terms of humanitism um, and turn it around to where it becomes more on the righteousness end of the spectrum. And I know it's probably strategy, but it's, it's kind of um, spinning around in my head and I'm not really getting it. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Does that make sense at all? Um, maybe if Apostle Adeforasi understands it, he can answer first before I come in. If he wants you to repeat, you can repeat because you were very specific. You said, you know, the things he taught tonight really helped you and set you thinking. So let's hear from him. And then maybe if I still need to come in, I come in. If I don't need to come in, I don't even come in at all. Amen. We, we, we need, I believe, in my humble opinion, that we need to have a multi-pronged approach. Um, and I take it from, 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 um, from Noah. 
Noah was a creature of righteousness. He spent 100 to 120 years preaching righteousness in a very corrupt world. And you know what? Out of all the millions, if not billions of people that populated the earth at that time, only eight, including himself, were saved. But I know what the eight, they were first his family. So God wants to restore the family gate. And it starts with us uh, 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 training our children in righteousness. We have to penetrate the educational gate and begin to inform uh, um, and change uh, the whole system. There has to be systemic reformation. At the same time, we need to get into government and governance so that we can begin to uh, 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 change the policies or, or the or, or uh, and uh, and so on and so forth, so that uh, we have the backing of government to begin to carry out educational reform. Because there has to be educational reform. So it has to be a multi-pronged approach of tribes of people invading the different mountains, even the media mountain, even the entertainment mountain. Because most of our children are watching a lot of entertainment. And Facebook, Instagram, um, Twitter are developing a narrative over uh, that, that is informing the value systems of their subscribers. We have to begin to penetrate those places and as salt and light effect change and transformation uh, through systemic reformation. It's a multi-pronged approach, but Abraham Noah started with his family. He started in his home. That's my two cents, sir. Over to you. You can give more light on that. I, I think, you know, you have answered her question from the angle of systems invasion. Because her point was, should we, she's still trying to process, should we actually use the tools that they're using without adopting their value system? So you can change a system best by coming from outside, but invading it. So you change it from within. You can cause it to collapse and change it. You can do other things because at the end of the day, wherever you had people being able to take cities, there had to be some information from within, et cetera, et cetera. And you rightfully, you know, pointed to Noah um, being in the place and he was preaching and all that. And then you've talked about governance. So if we want to do a thorough job, then we'll have to talk about 12 ways or four basic ways of systems invasion. I would ask her to do a little study, all of us here, a study on systems invasion. How do you invade systems to begin to transform and sometimes replace systems by displacement theory? So that becomes something that is important. So thank you for your two cents that are more than two cents. Uh, so I think what I would advise, not only Arlene, but every one of us, is to say, okay, look, these people are using principles sometimes that are general principles. Mm -hmm. The law of gravity or the law of attraction is law of attraction, you know, of bodies. Uh, whether you're, you know, Christian, Hindu, Shintoist, Muslim, Zoroastrian, et cetera, et cetera. So what are the laws? What are the principles? What are the tenets? What are the philosophies? What are the processes and process steps? We need to get those ones so they are delineated from the values that we do not want them to have. We talked about educational system. We talked about other kinds of systems that are there that are being used. They are not evil in themselves. It is when the evil people are operating them. 
just like politics is not supposed to be, even by definition, evil. It's supposed to be very good. But when you have dirty people, evil people running the show, that's what you end up getting. I don't know if that helps Sister Ali in any shape or form, because we have barely 10 minutes left. And I wanted to give room for the announcements and anything else that anybody wants to say before we close for the night, except if Brother Michael still has anything to say. Arlene, is that okay? Uh, yes, sir. I mean, yeah, I, I, it's going to be, if anything else, I, I will just um, eat a text because I'm thinking from a military perspective. So, you know, you have to excuse me because sometimes you can use the the things that, especially when it comes down to humanitism, um, humanitism in the secular word, and humanism. try to, yeah, secular try humanism. to turn it around, turn it around so that you don't really condemn it, but we know how to use it as a weapon to our advantage. So I was thinking from that perspective, but yes, thank you so much. This is, this is good. I understand that aspect of saying, turning it around, but that was the reason why I said, you are not going to be secular because seclorum means without God, non-divine, yes, uh -huh, yes. non-sacred, and you don't want yes. to do anything without God. But yes. what you are saying is the principles. Can we yeah. use their principles against them? They are not their principles. That what I, that's what I was saying in essence, Sister Aline. It is the principles that are universal principles given by God that they have copied and perverted. Mm -hmm. You know, from the military perspective, you know, there is a world of difference between strategy and even tactics on the battlefront. You yes. need the strategy, which is the master thing, but then you need the tactics when you get to the battlefront and depending on the conditions on the front, that's what we determine. And even if we wanted to use basic, basic, basic military understanding, you know, the first rule for successful warfare is locate your enemy, assess his strength relative to yours, you know, mm -hmm. do a very good recce of the, you know, terrain where the battle is supposed to be taking place. And then, of course, you have a clear understanding of what you're trying to do in terms of deployment. Maybe the mm -hmm. next meeting, we need to talk about deployment. Maybe you can share with us militarily. What does it take? How do you ensure you have assessed everything based yes. on what is there? including the aspect of even the preparation of your troops and all that, and making sure there is familiarization and tooling and all of those things before the actual, you know, launching out, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, you concentrate your firepower on the enemy until it's uh -huh. completely eliminated. And you set up your own, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, post there. Because even for basic, basic, basic things like beach heads, you normally will just use it as a launching pad after you've taken that beach head, isn't mm -hmm. it? Oh, yes, sir. So, so it's understanding what it is that you're dealing with. And that's why I try to just summarize it that way, you know, but we can't interrogate it further. I understand, sir. I understand, okay. sir. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, does Adefarasim want to say anything else? Otherwise, we'll go straight to Sharon and then or whoever else is lined up to give announcements and then we'll pray for the night. Unless Jörg or any of the others have anything to say. As I see others have joined, I might want to say one or two things. If you do, please indicate so we allow you just a minute or two each, and then we we'll go ahead and let us take the announcements and then we pray and close for the day. I, I just wanted to ask us uh, for books on systems and systems invasion. Okay, um, there are books, some of them 
like Donella Meadows, her own, some people say is too technical, uh, but that is one that I've found very useful. The one that I see people seem to like is the one from Sunday Adelaja on systems. I can look them up quickly and probably show you the covers. Uh, then uh, in terms of systems invasion, uh, not necessarily that I have seen one, but maybe you know, now that you have said it, I need to search deeper than I have searched so that then we can see, you know, uh, books on systems invasion. I rather happen to have developed the four basic steps for systems invasion. But uh, this lady, the, Miss Meadows, um, thinking in systems, Donella Meadows, you know, she would have, I think, the 12 ways to invade a system. But it might be a bit, you know, technical for some people. Um, let me show you what the covers look like, okay? Um, let me see. Donella Meadows, I'm going to my library, a Kindle, and then I will show you the one for uh, Brother Sandy Adelaja, and then that should do it. So we'll just take that one. Okay. Um, let me see, where are we? Okay. Thinking in Systems by Donella Meadows. Uh, I think even the Sunday Adelaja is a similar kind of title, but let me just see what I can do quickly on this sharing what the cover looks like. Here we go. So she would have both the aspect of systems design, systems you know, development and all that. And then maybe the aspect of, you know, uh, how to invade systems, but she doesn't use that is creating change in systems. So that's the one that a chapter under part three. I hope you can see the cover. Yes, sir. I have that. I have okay. that. So we, we, then we you did would, that in Costrad many years yes, ago. We did, yeah. we did actually recommend that in Costrad. Now, you would then agree with me that hardly have we found, at least hardly have I, I don't know, for you to have been asking, maybe hardly have you found also uh, a text that talks about invading system. So what, is, what that is saying to me is that necessity is laid upon us to try and write on systems invasion. I have taught systems invasion, but I haven't read a book yet on systems invasion. Um, so let me see if we can so do you have the one by Sunday Adelaide? No, I don't have that particular okay, one. That I'm... actually is quite simple. Uh, I will show the cover. System building, the key to something, something. Let me see if I can quickly get to that. There are so many books on systems alone. I probably have about 20 or 22, maximum 24 books on systems. But I try to show you the ones that I think help with what probably we're looking for immediately. So system building uh, by, what's the name now? Uh, Sandia Delaja. So, okay, here we go. cover so that I can show that to you. Okay.
Sorry, should come on now. Okay. Good, because he gives very, very basic ways of doing it and, you know, examples. Yeah. System building, the key to resolving every problem and attaining every goal. And he even quotes Edwards Deming, a bad system will beat a good person every time. Even where I am, when I started teaching systems, you know, brother Jörg and maybe sister Sharon will bear me out. The people felt I was wasting time. But now everybody is thankful to God. Uh, things have worked out well. And every day I'm hearing new testimonies, literally every day since I've been here. And each time I'm encouraged and I can see the progress the body is making. So I hope these two would do for now. Uh, we can discuss and give you others. I will try and sift through the 20 something titles and then see which one will be most useful for people. All right, is this Sister Sharon? Yes, sir. I'm okay, ready. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you everyone for being with us this night, this morning. I would like to first start by sharing with you that this uh, platform that you just entered is open every day from three to midnight UTC. And I put the hours on the chat. If we invite you to join us for prayer and Bible reading at various times. So from three to six, there'll be people praying. From six to nine, there'll be people reading the Bible. Then from 1200 to 1500 hours, there'll be prayer again. From 1500 to 1800 hours, Bible reading again. From 1800 to 2100 hours prayer, and from 2100 hours to midnight, Bible reading. These hours are in UTC. Please feel free to join. It is very important. If you need to reach me for anything, the email address is admin at the globalaltowatch.org. And our next meeting will be on the seventh day of the week on February 11th, 2023 at the same time you joined, which is 1900 hours UTC. For those in North America, it's 2 p.m. And for everybody else, um, just put it into Google. They'll tell you what your time is. Thank you so much. Anybody has questions, please, if you need, if you need resources, please go ahead and send the email and we will get them to you as soon as possible. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Well, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and make you more and more of a true expression of his glory, his person, nature, character, and function, even beyond our wildest imagination, according to his mighty power that's at work within us. In the most excellent name, of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Shalom to you all, Amen. those of you from Kenya. Amen. If there is anybody with Kenya Amen. Airways, let please get in touch with any of my PAs or even you know 